Hello guys, welcome back. My name is Nathan and today we are going to be ranking the five winners and five losers of the 2021 NHL offseason so far. Now we are a few days into free agency and most of the big moves that we've seen this offseason I think have come, but when it comes to every single NHL team right now, who do I think were the biggest winners this offseason, the biggest losers, and what do I see as the best moves and the worst moves this offseason? Watch till the end for all of the winners, all the loser picks, and hit that subscribe button if you're new. 60% of the people watching are not subscribed. If you like hockey, this is the place to be. Now, how today's video is going to work is that we're going to go through five different winners and five different losers this offseason. But the way I see the winners and losers this offseason basically comes down to what the weaknesses were going into this offseason. Did they solve them? Did they leave them? What did they bring in? What did they take out? And how does the roster look like compared to the start of this NHL offseason? How much better of a position are they in compared to where they were before? And a great example of a winner, I think, in this NHL offseason was a team that added some great draft surplus, got some great young prospects, and also added a lot of good NHL quality on the team. And we're going to go to the first winner of the NHL offseason, not technically I guess the biggest winner, but I would say one of the bigger winners in the New Jersey Devils. Now their offseason might not even be done, but honestly for New Jersey, I love what they did. They add some amazing defensemen like Dougie Hamilton and Ryan Graves onto that defense, and they weren't really stopping there. They got Jonathan Bernier as a great fringe guy to really give the, some of the stress off of Mackenzie Blackwood, which I I think it was desperately needed. They got Luke Hughes, of course, Christian Jaros under that defense, and coming out was Ryan Murray, Mel Mikhail Maltsev, Aaron Dell, Nick Merkley, Nathan Bastian. Nobody that really had a huge part on that New Jersey team, but they added some big-time guys, and obviously Dougie Hamilton was the big fish. New Jersey got him at a relatively okay price considering the situation, and he'll be a number one offensive defenseman there, but just everything they added, especially targeting defense, I think will vastly help him this upcoming season, and if they weren't in the Metro, if they were in the Pacific Division, I think they could could be a playoff team, but the competition will still be super tough for them. But still, for a rebuilding team, I think they use their cap space incredibly well, and I think this team could be super competitive, even in a super strong Metro Division next season. But we're now going to move on to the first loser of this NHL offseason, a team that's gone just clowned upon, and rightfully so, and it's not exactly the moves they made that I think are baffling, it's more so the potential they've lost, and also how they've made their different moves. We're going to move on to the first loser and move on to the Vegas Golden Knights. Now, everybody's clowning on them, and rightfully so. Still the fact fact that Marc-Andre Fleury learned about his trade on Twitter is baffling, but you also have to think about it as well. He was traded for nothing and he found out on Twitter. That whole situation really, to me, turned the Vegas Golden Knights offseason into an okay one to a disastrous one. And especially with their glaring weakness at center, they've not fixed that whatsoever. Not have not even one guy, if you unless you count Nolan Patrick, who is just kind of the same for them. They've lost to Moss Nosek, so maybe Patrick slots in there. But they needed a top six center badly, and that's still a weakness going into next year. Unless they have this huge Jack Eichel trade going on here, there's really just so much not to like in Vegas right now with that flurry trade situation, with all they've given up in the offseason as well, with free agency. They just are not a better team, and at this point, I mean, if it weren't for the division, I don't know if they'd be a clear shot number one. Right now in the Pacific, they still are, I think, but it's not been a good offseason. And again, with how that flurry trade was handled. I just don't really see too many big free agents wanting to go to Vegas anymore with how they treated their big stars, especially Flurry. And that whole situation is just disgusting for a guy that will eventually be a Hall of Famer. And also the fact that they brought on Brett Howden willingly is just another L to the Vegas Golden Knights offseason so far. But we're now going to move on to the second winner of this NHL offseason, a team that I thought did very, very well for themselves in terms of rebuilding, getting some salary cap on their books, but also getting some picks in the meantime. They made some fantastic trades and got some great draft surplus. We're now going to move on to a team that actually had a strong offseason somehow in the Arizona Coyotes. Now the Arizona Coyotes, looking at what they brought in what they actually brought out, it's crazy the amount of draft picks they were able to uh, compile. When it comes to their in right now, obviously they 
got Dylan Gunther from the OEL trade, but they got Dylan Gunther, they got uh, Shane Gosper, Anton Stroman, Andrew Ladd, Vladislav Kalichanok. They got five second round picks, two third round picks, but you go out uh, OEL, you have also Connor Garland getting away from them, and Antti Rantz as one of their bigger free agents leaving the team. But you get rid of that OEL contract and you still have all these different picks assembled. That's what happened when you trade for Andrew Ladd, when you trade for guys like Anton Stroman. You get some major surplus back, and that's exactly what uh, Arizona, quite frankly, should be doing. In their situation as a rebuilding team with revenue sharing, they should be getting on contracts for big cap hits, and they were really arguably the team that did it the most this offseason. They brought in guys for free like Shane Gossespierre and got picks for him back, and even Andrew Ladd, you got two second-round picks. Not a bad job by that Arizona management, and honestly, one of the strongest off-seasons in terms of maximum value that they've had in a long time. But especially with how things have gone in Arizona as of late and the whole they might move to Houston thing, uh, it's a pretty good bright spot for a team that desperately needs it. But we're now going to move on to the second loser of this NHL offseason, a team that I think took some major risks, and I got to commend them for it, major risks, and it could pay off potentially. But to me, the big problems with this team were defense and also just a lack of anybody behind their star young goaltender. And in a lot of ways, some, some ways they might have fixed that. That maybe, but in others, I just was left disappointed, especially with how much they gave up. We're now going to move on to the second loser and move on to the Philadelphia Flyers. Now, what they brought in, just in terms of guys, you got Cam Atkinson in the Jacob Voracek trade. You, of course, got other guys on top of that, like Rasmus Salainen and Ryan Ellis and Keith Yandel on that defense. You brought in Martin Jones onto the goaltending as well. And I will say this, I really like the Cam Atkinson trade for them. I think that could really have some good potential. And for what they gave up with Ryan Ellis, I mean, you might as well make that deal. But again, the problem with Philadelphia was just pure defense. And unless Rasmus versus the line just becomes a Norris Trophy guy, I really don't see Philadelphia, Philadelphia's defense being that much better, especially when you bring in Keith Yandel, who's one of the worst defensive players in the entire league, and also Martin Jones as your backup. To me, again, Philadelphia needed some major stability under Carter Hart, and you get a goalie who's the exact opposite. Inconsistent, unstable, and just isn't really a calming presence whatsoever. Ever. To me, for Philadelphia, it could pay off and they could be a playoff team, but in a division like the Metro, there's really no breathing room. And I think for Philadelphia, the defense isn't vastly improved. The goaltending isn't really improved. And their playoff hopes right now, lying solely on Carter Hart, is a risky option and it didn't exactly work for them last season. We'll see what happens, but it could be an interesting and long season for the Flyers. But now we're going to transition on to the third winner of this NHL offseason. And this GM doing fantastic things is not surprising whatsoever. But he just continues to stick to the plan and has had some amazing moves this offseason. The big thing for this team, I thought, was goaltending for the future. What were they really going to look like in net? And they absolutely solved it. And a lot of other great moves on top of that, too. We're going to go on to the third winner of the offseason and move on to Steve Eiserman's Detroit Red Wings. Now, I thought their draft was solid, their trading was solid, their free agency was really, really good, and all of that combined to just be a great offseason overall, but again, in goal, you got a steal with the Alex and Delkovich trade, and you also drafted Sebastian Kosa in the first round of this draft, which I think is going to be huge for them in the future, but you also got the drafty, of course, in Simone Edvinson, who I think in Detroit system could be very, very solid, and you also got the additions outside of that, like P.S. Suter in free agency, which I think is fantastic, the trade for Mitchell Stevens, which is an absolute no-brainer. And looking at the guys they got out, obviously they're going to miss Jonathan Bernier for right now. They're going to miss a guy like a Luke Lennon perhaps, but it's nothing too crazy for Detroit, and their future looks a lot better in every single position. Again, that goaltending for the future was a big worry for me, and they solved it absolutely with not just a young starter now, but a great young starter for the future. But now we're going to move on to the third loser of the NHL offseason. And I want to say free agency was solid for them. I think they made some great signings. But at the same time, with the potential this team had, it's still pretty baffling what they did in the expansion draft. Going to my third loser of the offseason, I have the Seattle Kraken. Now, I don't think they're a humongous loser. I still think the team is decent and could make the playoffs in the Pacific Division. But with that Pacific Division, I think you could have assembled a team that would have been 
a for sure thing. That Pacific sucks. And to me, for Seattle, it's kind of just a maybe now. And the team does, does still have some solid parts. I really like that defense. The goaltending could be good, but again, there's a lot of risk there. I think for Seattle, they're doing a lot of the right things, but they're not doing as many of the right things, I think, as Vegas. I was still super disappointed with some of those picks in the expansion draft. They lost uh, Gavin Bader from the Columbus Blue Jackets for nothing. He went right back to Columbus because he was a UFA, but you could have got a guy like Max Domi or, a, or Kevin Stenland. To me, there was a lot of potential in the expanded draft that still was left off that hasn't really been explained yet, and they do have, still have some pretty big cap space on the books, but at the same time, I think there still could be some major scoring that is missing there in the first season, and again, if they miss the, if they miss the playoffs in the Pacific Division, that's just not what you want to see. I think Seattle does still want to contend, it looks like, but they're a weird team where they're kind of at both ends of the spectrum. But now we're going to move on to the fourth winner of the NHL offseason, a team that I think made it has some pretty big moves in terms of defense, not too many free agent signings per se, and they did lose a couple of interesting pieces, but I think overall for this team, it's trending in the right direction, and they still have quite a bit of cap space to work with for this offseason. And going on to my fourth winner, I have the Winnipeg Jets. Now, to me, Winnipeg is a super interesting team. Obviously, you lost Mason Appleton in the expanded draft, which I think is their biggest loss of the of the offseason, but to me, when it comes to Winnipeg, I mean, they can recoup that. They have some really solid players coming up in the, in the system forward-wise as well. Maybe Cole Perfetti takes that next step next year, and that could be a factor. But the main problem for me, Winnipeg-wise, was defense. And they didn't lose Dylan DeMello, which I thought was a miracle. Then you bring in Brendan Dillon and Nate Schmidt, who I think make that defense into something a lot better and more consistent than when it was last year. Now, they might still have some goaltending problems, perhaps, with Brassois leaving them. But at the same time, I think for Winnipeg, with the guys they have coming up, like Henula and, and, and Perfetti, I think they will have some guys that will come up and be good for them next year. And again, that defense, I think, although not totally solved, is much better, I think, on paper than last year. Dylan, I think, is going to be great for them. Schmidt, I think, is going to be great for them in a good offensive role. And I think for Winnipeg, they will likely be a playoff team once again in the Central next year. And another thing I forgot to mention with Winnipeg is that they have $7.7 .7 million in cap space still, so there is room to sign a guy like Tomas Tatar and get an extra forward that they could really need for this next season. But we're now going to move on to the fourth loser of the NHL offseason, a team that can really only be described right now as cheap and greedy at this point, a team that I think had so much potential this offseason and has wasted almost every single bit of it. We're now going to move on to the fourth, big, uh, fourth loser and not even the biggest loser of the offseason in the Carolina hurricanes now there has been some decent deals i really like the even bear trade for them i will i think he's gonna be awesome on that defense and i think bring in a guy like uh like a like an anti rats isn't the worst idea but when you think about the potential they could have had, this offseason is just flat out disappointing. They went from a confusing, not really certain, uh, goaltending tandem in Morazic and Adelkovic to an even worse tandem in, in, in Ronta and Freddie Anderson. Even though I like Ronta, they had so much cap space to go after a big guy. They could have gone after Linus Olmark and made it work so perfectly well. They paid more for both Anderson and Ronta than what Linus Olmark ended up giving. Even, even Phil Grubauer would have been a good option for them. And at the same time, you look at the other moves like Tony D'Angelo missing, uh, obviously leaving Dougie Hamilton to go away, I think is just mystifying for a team that had so much cap space in the next couple of seasons. But guess what? The Carolina Hurricanes aren't even the biggest loser of this offseason because there is one man that has made it his mission to be the biggest loser of this offseason. And I want to say for the fans of this team, I desperately hope it works out for you guys. I'm pleading and begging it works out for you guys but I just don't see it whatsoever. We're going to move on to Ken Holland's Edmonton Oilers. In my opinion, the biggest loser of this offseason. Now, I think there could be a couple moves that could be decent for them. I think Zach Kyman could fit in pretty well these first couple of seasons, but with the potential they brought out and the, the, the table scraps they brought in, to me, Edmonton is just a flat-out worse team, and they could have been a true playoff uh, contender and an easy team to go in the playoffs in the Pacific Division. Now they're kind of a wild card right now and in terms of what they brought in obviously they got in Duncan Keith they got in Zach Hyman Cody Cece Warren Fogle Derek Ryan as a uh, guy and on the third line Tyson Berry got extended bringing out though you got Adam Larson Ethan Bear Caleb Jones a 2022 third rounder and you still have no clear-cut starter I know Mike Smith was good for you last year but a two-year extension for a 39 year old is just not what you want to be doing when you need every single bit of cap space you can get and when it comes to Edmonton the defense they left off Adam 
Larson, just give him the extra 500k, give him the extra million. He is worth it. One of the best defensive years of an of any Oiler in a long time last year was fantastic for you. And now Darnell Nurse wants nine million dollars. Good luck fitting every single one of those guys on the roster. It wouldn't have worked out, especially with the Duncan Keith and and now the Tyson Berry signings. I just don't get it whatsoever. Edmonton, they had a ton of potential to get a starter, to get some more rock solid defenders, to keep Adam Larson like they should have. That really should have been the number one priority. And once he left to Seattle, it was the biggest red flag of them all. Even even less, even more than the Duncan Keith deal, even more than that. Adam Larson leaving is horrendous and a terrible job by the entire Edmonton organization. They should be ashamed by that. And they just don't really have the value. They didn't really keep guys that they should have. They brought in negative guys. They brought in negative value and they got rid of a ton of younger players. To me, for Edmonton, there was so much potential wasted. And again, they could have been a for sure playoff team. Now, once again, it's a maybe. And for a team with Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, your playoff hopes should never be a maybe in the easy the worst division in the entire NHL. A terrible job by Ken Holland, and uh, I don't think it's gonna work in 2022. But you know what? We're not going to end this video with any 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 sad nonsense. We're going to go on to the final winner of the NHL offseason, the fifth winner of this NHL offseason, a team that I think did a fantastic job in drafting in terms of value, in terms of keeping their guys. We're going to move on to a team that has really started the rebuild, I guess, in this past year, and again, is going out, at, uh, going out with an absolute bang right now in the Columbus Blue Jackets. Just an exceptional job by Yarmo Ketkalainen in this offseason. Season. And even though the one deal I wasn't really too sure about was the Jacob Voracek deal, I would rather have Cam Atkinson. Pretty much every other trade, I think, is a win for them. Now, in terms of what they brought in this offseason, you have some big, big guys. In terms of what we see, we have Adam Boquist, Ken Johnson, Cole Sillinger, a 2022 Forrest, who got Jake Bean, Jacob Voracek, Sean Corrali, Zach Rensky had that huge signing. And then you also kept coming out Seth Jones, Cam Atkinson, and a 2021 second, which was involved in the Jake Bean deal. But looking at the defense they brought in, looking at the skilled young prospects they got as well, that were also factored into this last trade deadline. Yomo Kekalan is doing a fantastic job restocking the Columbus Blue Jackets that desperately needed some great young talent, and they've now got that. With the Seth Jones trade, obviously that's a big guy, but he only had one year left and wasn't re-signing there. They had pretty much no leverage and still got a ton back from the Chicago Blackhawks. Same thing goes as well with the Jake Bean trade. I mean, he was a guy that I, I was out there for a second round pick. Columbus pulled the trigger, and their draft was once again fantastic. You get a guy like Adam Boquist as well in the Seth Jones trade to get some young, talented prospects. To me, Columbus is starting out this rebuild fantastic. And they'll be a team that's in the hunt for Shane Wright and Brian Lambert next year, and even Connor Bedard afterwards. This is a team that could be fantastic in another couple of seasons. And I think with this rebuild starting now, it's perfect timing for them to start with a clean slate and just go for it. And so far, they've done it masterfully. Masterfully? Masterfully. <laughs> But that'll be it for today, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed, make sure you hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell if you haven't already. Comment down below, what do you agree and disagree with my picks and who do you see as the biggest winners and losers of the offseason, as well as your favorite NHL team. Are they a winner or a loser? Let me know. And make sure you share this video with your friends. Get the winners and losers out there and click on this card for all my hockey rankings contents right in one playlist. Once again, boys, this is the place to be. If you like hockey, subscribe if you are new. Have a great day, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.